Medic! Hey guys, welcome back to the Medic Up Podcast. Today on the show, I've got Bill Harris. Bill's a 20-year U.S. Navy veteran with multiple combat tours to the Middle East. He spent eight years serving beside U.S. Marines as a Fleet Marine Force Corpsman, seven years supporting Naval Special Warfare. He currently teaches at a a federal law enforcement training center and provides operational medical support to various agencies. He's on the board of advisors for the Committee for Tactical Emergency Casualty Care, and he co-founded the nonprofit First Care Provider, which helps teach everyday citizens how to save lives in emergencies. He's a nationally registered paramedic, a military master training specialist, and a tactical medical authority. Don't forget to check out our sponsors, Fuel the Machine Apparel. Fuel the Machine Apparel is based on the idea of not just a brand, but a lifestyle. The crew at Fuel the Machine believes you have to take care of yourself before you can help others. Fuel the Machine Apparel is pro-health, pro-first responder, and pro-military. First First responder owned and operated, and they are their own quality control. All their designs are created and printed in the USA. Remember, free shipping to the USA and to all military addresses. Fuel the Machine Apparel. Be the solution, not the problem. Go check out Fuel the Machine Apparel at www.fuelthemachineapparel.com. Medical Gear Outfitters. Owned and operated by a paramedic with a mission to equip individuals with top quality supplies, training, and the mindset they need to empower themselves to respond in an emergency. Medical Gear Outfitters has the equipment and the training you need to be ready. Head over to www.medicalgearoutfitters.com to check out their selection of pre-made first aid kits and trauma kits. If you're looking for a Stop the Bleed kit, Medical Gear Outfitters has you covered. Do you want to build your own kit? Medical Gear Outfitters has the bags, pouches, and supplies you need to build a purpose-built kit to your own specifications. Everything from an at-home family first aid kit for bumps, bruises, scrapes, and stings to the individual first aid kits for first responders and work kits, car kits, and larger kits for active violence or mass wounding events. You need something specific and you don't see it on the website? Contact Medical Gear Outfitters and let them help you get exactly what you need. Free shipping on all local orders. Use the link in the show notes for 10% off when you visit www.medicalgearoutfitters.com. Remember, you never know when you will be the first responder. Get the right gear and the right training. Medical Gear Outfitters. So without further ado, here's Bill Harris from First Care Provider. I have Bill Harris of First Care Provider on the podcast today. Let's get that out of the way. Thanks for coming. Thanks for sitting down. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's a, a, a pleasure. I'm I'm proud to be here. Absolutely, man. Thank you. Um, so before we get into what First Care Provider is, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit of the background on the Stop the Bleed initiative and how First Care Provider came to be? Uh, yeah, great. About me, uh, I am by way of New York City. Uh, I grew up uh, the son of a firefighter, so kind of grew up in a firehouse. Um, was a typical uh, city kid. All I cared about was playing baseball and hockey and football and had no idea what I wanted to be when I grew up. Uh, and then I suddenly found myself uh, dropped out of college and with a new wife. So uh, I did what most, uh, you know, 19-year-olds that don't have any clue what direction they want to head in life do and they have bills to pay. I joined the military. <laughs> so uh, I joined the Navy. Um, and I say we joined the Navy because my wife you know, we kind of enlisted together. and She wasn't on active duty, but she certainly knew what we were signing up for. And I was very blessed that my dad had spent a little bit of time in the Navy, and he kind of came down with me when it came time to select a job. And I wound up choosing to be a hospital corpsman. I didn't didn't know anything about the Navy. Um, you know, people ask why the medic route. Um, and the only reason I think that it resonated with me is I had been a lifeguard before, and I think I'd maybe been a CPR instructor. You know, so not that that qualifies you to be a medic, but it, you know, kind of puts you in that realm where you're a little familiar with public safety. Um, so I was really blessed that, you know, I had a long list of jobs that I was offered. I got offered to be a corpsman. I came to the Navy, and I absolutely loved it. Um, it was a blessing in disguise. I still believe it's the greatest job on the planet. And, and, I, and I think now I look at it differently, not just being a military medic, but just being a medic in general. Um, you know, having an opportunity to, to be a difference maker in somebody's life is, is a privilege, and it's a gift. And it's a gift that when you're young, um, you don't you – don't, realize how much of a gift it is. Um, So I did 21 years of active duty. Uh, I was very blessed in my career. I got a chance to see lots of different parts of the Navy. Um, I love the appeal of spending time on the Marine Corps side. So I spent a a big chunk of the beginning of my career uh, as an embedded greenside medic. Actually, the first thing you do as a a typical hospital corpsman, you work at a hospital. Um, 
you know, and you really learn. I mean, it's like any other school, right? You learn the minimal amount you need to know, just enough to be dangerous, and then they turn you loose. And so for us, we, we spend our first duty station has to be in a hospital under the guidance of a nurse. And I worked in pediatrics, um, and I, you know, I learned some pretty valuable lessons there. I learned that I didn't want to work on a, on a hospital ward, um, and I relatively quickly, that was right around the time of the Gulf War, I kept requesting to go. You know, other people were getting tagged to go and were unhappy about it. And I was like, I'll take your place. And they wouldn't let me go at that point because I didn't have my field medical training. Um, so I, you know, I wanted to get off the ward. I didn't, didn't love, you know, just kind of working on the floor. I didn't love that sort of nursing angle. I, I'd learned a lot, um, but I wanted to do something else. And so I, you know, wiggled and finagled my way down into the emergency room. And they sent me to EMT school from there. And, you know, that was sort of the first introduction for me to trauma and to medicine. And frankly, I worked at a, a, you know, a training hospital. We didn't see a lot of trauma. We didn't do a lot of responses. We did a lot more transports. Um, but you start learning the craft. You start learning, you know, what an ambulance life is like. And then from there, uh, I took orders to a ship. And you learn you know, a lot a lot about that side of the Navy. I, I learned that the best ship in the Navy for me was citizenship. <laughs> I didn't... I didn't absolutely love being on a ship. It's a, an enormous amount of work. I have a profound respect for the, you know, for the work that gets done out there. Um, but it, it's tough duty. It's a lot of, especially when you're a lower ranking guy. Um, there was a lot less medicine and a lot more cleaning and painting. And, um, you know, I could work a, what we call a swab or a mop, like it's nobody's business. So, um, but I, I did learn, I, I was fortunate in my time on the ship. I learned, um, we had an aviation uh, aerospace med tech guy that had gotten in some trouble and he was removed from the ship and I sort of got put in that billet without having had the training. So, you know, it sounds super sexy and fancy and really all you do is a lot of physicals and really the doctors are doing the physicals. You do a lot of the paperwork. So, um, but it was something different, you know, it was something outside of the realm. And then I, you also start to learn, you know, basic sick call, you know, which in the military is an interesting animal because you, you know, long before the PA program was resurrected, you know, you start learning how to see patients and you're learning how to get a Merck manual and learning how to take, you know, take a history and how to essentially diagnose people, you know, and start handing out medications, which is really our full time job, you know, on, on a ship. You know, the military mindset is is get get these guys healthy and get and gals and get them back to work, right? Get them, you know, in combat, get them back up on a gun, on a ship, get them back to doing their job. So so like I said, I was blessed. I did I did an overseas tour. Um, I decided when I left the ship, I wanted to go to independent duty school, which was a 13 month specific training program, um, which is, it's really difficult to explain. I think the concept for the Navy side is that you, um, you'd be able to go on a small ship absent of a doctor and, and be the doctor for them. You know what I mean? We learn how to read labs. We learn how to make diagnosis. We learn when, Hey, this is an emergency. We need a helicopter to get this guy out of here. Or, Hey, I think this is just gas pain and we're going to sit on him for a couple of days. It's not appendicitis. So you really start to hone your craft. And then I did some overseas duty. From there, I went to Iceland. Um, and then the war kicked off. So my career, again, I was very blessed. It was split in half, 10 years of peacetime military and then 10 years of combat, multiple deployments. And most of the tail end of my career, I was a uh, support medic at Naval Special Warfare Development Group. Um, you know, so to get to be at a, you know, a very high-level SEAL team, you know, as a, a, at first as a medic working in medical, and then I was moved to a, an actual combat squadron or, you know, where I was the senior medic in a squadron and had a couple of medics that worked for me. So really blessed to have seen a bunch of different things. I even did a small tour um, with a, uh, a flight squadron, which, again, was a lot of admin and physicals. But, but it was nice because I never really got pigeonholed, and I got to see a lot of different things. So 21 years, and I retired in 2010. And now I've been primarily an instructor since then, you know, much like yourself, teaching Teaching a little bit of everything. I, I, I did go back at one point to teach EMT school just to sort of get back into it and see. Um, I didn't I didn't completely love it. And this was now probably six years ago. Um, and the curriculum back then hadn't been updated. So I was very frustrated with we've got lots of scientific evidence and changes about doing things better, yet we're not – they're not at the curriculum level. We're not able to teach it to the students, and it's still not in the test. So, you know, back then we, we still weren't even talking about tourniquets. So it was a little frustrating to me to not be able to, to put out the most up-to-date information. Fr frustrating is an is an understatement. Um, yeah, I I was right there, right there with that frustration frustration with you. Uh, even you know before the curriculum change at the the national level for EMT and paramedic, and you know I still I still we we still hear it like oh well you're not allowed to pack wounds. Yeah, yeah you are. 
Absolutely. And it's expected of you. And it's, it finally caught up, at least at our state level, to it just made that into the BLS statewide type protocols about a year ago. It actually was in black and white. And really for four years prior to that, my my graduate EMTs and paramedics were were being taught how to do it and expected to do it if if the if the need you know came up, so I get it. So with all your, I mean, with the the independent duty, uh, all that stuff, did that was it a natural progression for you to just come out and want to teach, especially you know kind of being tasked to um, the SEAL team, you know, as a senior medic having to do some of the education for for the other guys and stuff. Yeah, I, th- I think. I think it's the same on the civilian side too. I think as as you sort of progress in your career field, there's an expectation that you're going to teach. You know what I mean? You've been there long enough. You know the ropes. You you start having to indoctrinate other folks into the system, whatever the system is. Um, for me, what really changed, I, I look at teaching as an absolute gift, and I, I am humbled and honored to participate in the profession of it, and I love the study of it. You know what I mean? I love teaching now folks how to teach because – I didn't know any of that, and I've had to figure a lot of that out on my own. So I, I have a lot of respect for somebody who, who puts an enormous amount of work in and then shows up on game day and, and puts passion into it and really, really teaches what you need to know. And we, we've all had instructors that, that are that way, that, hey, man, that, that really resonated with me. He, he explained it or she explained it in a way that, that hits home with me. And, and you realize that, that that's not by accident. It's because they believe what they're saying, and it's because they put the work in. And we've all had the flip side of that, somebody who's reading the slides to us. So. Read the slides and just tell you, yeah, yeah, and just listen to me. I'm the expert reading the slides. Do this. Get yeah. a good grade and I, get out. Right. So I, I fell into it, frankly. I had no clue. Like I said, I've always sort of been one of those I, I'd love to – I always envy when, when you talk to somebody. They go, oh, I knew I wanted to be a doctor from the time I was in third grade. And I'm like, I have so much respect for you for doing that. I'm like, I wish I was that person, but I never – I never felt that way. So even for teaching for me, um, I started by happenstance. I started teaching live tissue labs, which is obviously a big thing in the military. Um, and, and, you know, quickly realized, hey, I, I'm good at this and I enjoy this. Um, you know, I started getting feedback. And they're like, hey, you really need to do more of this. And that, that's what sort of made me step back a little and open the aperture and say, hey, you know what? Maybe I, I need to start teaching some more and start looking into this. And, and again, there was also back then – an enormous demand for TCCC everywhere. You know, we weren't, we were really only teaching the medics and special forces units. So the rest of the military needed it. And then obviously the, the rest of the civilian world, first responders all needed it. So, so there was a huge demand right at the same time when, when I sort of fell in love with the profession of it. That's fantastic. So how did you get from, from there to starting up, you know, the nonprofit or you know, the whole first care provider, let's get out there and, and educate the masses. Yeah, well, it was interesting. We, we, myself and Dr. Bobka, who's who's you know the co-founder of First Care, we've been heavily involved with the TECC committee for a long time. And I think for us, what we what we sort of realized was we loved what TECC was doing, right? TECC, and, and you'll ask people. So there's still plenty of people in our space now that don't even understand the difference between TCCC and TECC. Um, but TECC had the foresight to realize that hey. The military model is great, but it's not plug and play. You can't just take the way you were training a ranger battalion and show up and teach your church, church group that way or teach, you know, volunteer firefighters that way. So it's a different subset of people. So so we were involved and we loved it. And I think what we sort of realized is that, you know, the way that I, I, I explain to people is our survival rates in combat were higher than they've ever been in the history of combat. And And when we ask people, what do you think the reasons are for that? You know, we get we get a myriad of answers. You know, we get better body armor. We get the fact that at one point in Afghanistan there were more trauma surgeons than there were in, in most cities. Um, we get technological advances in medicine. We get you know you know more literature to support what we're doing. And and I think those are all great answers. My personal opinion, our personal opinion, is that I think the reason our survival rates have changed exponentially on the military side is because we changed our approach. And our approach went from the civilian approach, which is, hey, if something bad happens, call an expert. And, and as medics, we were the experts. And the military scrubbed that and said, you know what? Everybody's going to get training. The training will be consistent. Everybody will have equipment. Everybody's got buy-in here from, from top down. And everybody understands it's their job to try to fix this and buy time until an expert can get there. And so we think that's why our survival rates are so high, right? It's a complete change from the norm. And what 
we noticed with TECC is, hey, we're, we're trying to take the military model and we're trying to throw tourniquets and we're trying to throw march or whatever algorithms into the mix. And that's all great, but it's all focused completely on first responders. And so training first responders is a great responsibility. And it's what I do for a living, what most of us do for a living, but it never changes the fact that those first responders are five to seven to eight to 16 minutes away for most folks. And so we realized quickly that, hey, we're traveling the country and we're training people, yet we're leaving our families at home and, and anybody who might have training still 10, 8, 12 minutes away. And so we quickly sort of, you know, said, you know, I think we're not looking at the big picture here. I, I think we're still undervaluing what, you know, the everyday citizen who's on scene can and should do. And again, that was long before there was a Stop the Bleed initiative or any of those things. So, so that was sort of the, you know, the what thrust us into start, starting to look way down the road. And that that's also... I mean, I couldn't agree more. And it's on in my case, you know, teaching the first responders, it, it was kind of like a like an aha moment. Like, hey, we need to be we need to be teaching this. Commercial tourniquets are better than what we what we already have a cravat and a, a windlass made out of my scissors or my flashlight. Or you know, wound packing is good. Chest seals are underrated. We need to use more of them. Um, you know, understanding that that respiratory physiology. <clears throat> um, but as as recently as this week, um, I got invited to evaluate uh, the medical care during an act, a very large scale active shooter exercise on a on a college campus, and uh, it, it went like it normally goes. You know, it was it was hard for the and it was to test rescue task force, and it was hard for normal everyday ambulance type responders to transition to uh, creating a casualty collection point inside an incident structure. Um, they just wanted to get the red tags out as fast as they possibly could. There wasn't too much care in the way of simple compression dressings on, uh, you know, the the more minor type uh, injuries, or we put a tourniquet on and no compression dressing over the over the uh, the actual wound. And while we're moving through it, I mean, and I was getting antsy. I had it on a stopwatch. I'm sitting there from the first shots fired to the first rescue task force entry was almost 16 minutes. And I'm like, no, not going to work. This, this has to, you know, the bleeding control has to happen in the in these classrooms, in the incident site. And I watched a lot of cops run past me who had IFACs on the front of their vest and found out that a lot of cop rescue was happening upstairs in the, in the, in the building. And I asked a couple of the other evaluators, I was like, hey, are these guys putting tourniquets on? Are these guys putting dressings and chest seals on? And he, we had even had one officer use... Uh, a decompression needle. And I was like, neat. You know, that guy had prior training. Um, you know, doesn't translate very well to others, but it was one of those like, hey, I waited, I had to wait for 16 minutes before the first set of two medics made entry into the building. And uh, at least some, that that care needs to be way sooner, whether it's a stop the bleed type kit in the classroom or people that are, you know, the, the the students who are personally carrying stuff in their in their you know everyday carry or backpack or whatever. So I agree with you 100. Uh, percent There was absolutely a need for it, and it didn't really translate from the military side to the first responder side to the to the everyday person side. So yeah, I I think for me when I started teaching and did doing a very similar thing, I worked up in, in New York State at the State Preparedness Training Center. And guys could see, you, you mentioned it, you said you were getting antsy, you're looking at your stopwatch. I got angry. And, you know, finally the cadre had to pull me aside and like, why are you so angry? I'm like, this is so wrong. And I think what I didn't understand is as instructors or as evaluators, we have to manage our expectations differently. And, and what ends up happening, we run these large scale exercises and we have unrealistic expectations of these folks that are coming in. Um, I, I've seen them where we do these drills and these folks are getting taught tourniquets or march literally in a parking lot 10 minutes before they run and in, you know, so, and, and like you alluded to, like the law enforcement guys have been doing this. They have much more training and much more experience and anybody with more training, more experience is always going to do something better. And the rest of the world can't understand that because these folks are medics. And I'm like, yes, but this is not what they do day to day. And medics resort to their day to day routines, right? That's what they fall back on. We, I remember going up to New York and we, we ran a special situations class and it's winter time, there's six feet of snow. We have this huge USAR rubble pile and I've got 26 patients, role players, mannequins, the whole shebang. And the ambulance shows up and they jump out and they do what they always do, right? They grab the jump bag and then they, they stop dropping the gurney out. And I'm like, 
where do you think you're going to push that in four feet of snow? You know, and, and it, but, you know, they're looking at me like I'm speaking a different language. And I'm like, how, how many people do you think this is going to help? And they're like, one. I'm like, well, no, technically three, right? It's going to help you and your partner. And it's going to help the person we put on the litter or the gurney. I'm like, how about the other 26? You know, but they don't, you know what I mean? If you don't have the experience or the training of thinking outside the box, of, of putting away what you day to, do day to day and doing it in a different light, then, it, then you, it's unrealistic for us to expect them to show up on those scenes and start doing things differently. So it, you know, it, it really is, it's a training issue. And you brought up the RTF and it's a hugely polarizing subject. Um, I think the concept of the RTF is great. I believe in a lot of it. I teach a ton of it, but I also think we've got to fix a lot of it. You know what I mean? It's not a one size fits all approach. And for us to think that that would ever be the case, I think is, is a little disingenuous to everybody involved. Oh, I agree. And that is, um, <clears throat> that's something I've been struggling with um locally uh and even at the i want i don't want to say state level because there is no real state level but other services around our state where a lot of people say all right hey am i doing this right i'm like i don't i don't know what do you, what do you, what part do you think is right or wrong and they're like well do i ha i have this and i have this many this many cops and this many medics this many firefighters i'm like okay does that work for your municipality uh, I don't know. That's why I'm asking you. I'm like, well, I don't know. Tell me about your municipality. Uh, I went and did a training, and uh, they had a we had a bunch of officers come to it as well to, to play escort. They were getting the medical training, uh, and then they were going to be the escorts for the the task force. And uh, just I know I'm spoiled. I have two large departments here where I live. I have a sheriff's department and a city police department. Tons of dudes, and um, I have I have I have two SWAT teams if I really need them. And I have plenty more in neighboring counties. And uh, there were like, I said, hey, just out of curiosity, I was like, how do you guys do single officer entry on your active shooter? Yes, we have to. I was like, okay. Um, how many how many other guys are on duty? And they're like, this this is it. This is the whole shift. I was like, well, there's four of you. I was like, oh. And so I looked at all the medics in the room and EMTs. I said, you're going to be on your own for a while. I said, there's, I said, where's your closest help? They're like highway patrol 15 minutes away. That's if he's in town and not on the highway. I was like, you're going to be on your own for a while. I said, you're going to have to come up with some different configurations. It's, it's the turnkey of, you know, um, four, four officers to escort, three officers to escort two medics or an, a medic and an EMT or an, a medic and a firefighter. It's not going to work here. I said, so now it's a small municipality. Um, they're just, it's just something they're going to have to overcome. So when you say, oh, am I doing this right? Well, no, you're not, because all I know is what works for where I am, where I have three officers, probably four, and two to three providers who are in the middle of them, and, you know, we have escorted warm zone care. Um, you know, again, spoiled, you you don't have the resources. So, you know, you're not going to go in with a single officer. He's got something to do, and you're going to have to wait. And now you're going to have to decide how do I go in without security or not. You know, you can't make it up on the fly. You have to plan it, so. Yeah, I, I know for us, we've got to change, especially on the EMS side, how we traditionally train. And I know that the entire, I know that the whole operation, whether it's a drill or not, is going to be a shit show. And the first thing I see are people putting themselves in harm's way by coming into a warm zone and they're carrying nothing but triage tags. And, and that's still happening. And I'm like, wait, so you're telling me you're going to come in here, maybe with a body armor, maybe not. And and and, I, and my contention is that triage tag has never saved anybody's life. No. It is the grandest waste of time in the history of what we're doing. First off, you guys are eyeballing this. And if you don't have an enormous amount of experience with quickly laying eyes on somebody and trying to figure out how to triage them, well, then then what color you rip off is completely subjective and changing so frequently. So, you know, that it, it's just a waste of time. But that's that's our system, right? That's how we train. That's how we teach. Get out these big colored tarps and. And let's sit everybody on this group come over here, you know. So there's so many of these things that that have been set in EMS stone forever that we're trying to fix, but the red tape of it and and the routine of it gets in the way and it takes forever. The, anybody who can come, anybody who can hear me can walk, come to the sound of my voice, and now leave the building. And you just alluded to a small agency, no help. Well, you just took all the able bodies that could help you and sent them out of the building, Unesco unescorted potentially, potentially injured. You know, like those folks could be holding pressure. Those folks could be. Your, you know, your litter bearers are carrying people. So, you know, it's, 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 we've got to go further back. And I think we've done that with, like you said, with the tourniquets, like it's finally now one of the skill checkoff sheets. I don't, even that, I don't love how it was done, but at least it's in there. Um, 
you know, and I think we need to do that with all of these things. And and it's interesting when we get in the mass casualty thing too, because I I'm always first to say we look at T Triple C, right? We tip our hat to T Triple C, and we look at it like, oh, you know, they're experts. And I'll tell you, the military has its problems too. There are plenty of things that T Triple C has been recommending for years that plenty of military medics still aren't doing, i.e., eye shields and other things. Um, and it's still not a perfect system. You know, I mean, it's a great baseline to get started with, but it's still based on each unit and who's doing the training. And, you know, the thing, there are a couple of things I think when we train that we all sort of do and we don't think about that probably are worth discussing. You know, a lot of times in the TCCC or TECC models, a, a good example of that would be, you know, we say, okay, the guy's injured. Now what are you going to do? And you, you talk through a March algorithm. And there's always this assumption that, they got injured and you started your care 10 seconds after the injury. You know what I mean? That every algorithm we've ever run, every scenario, okay, this happened, what are you going to do? And I'm like, well, what if you don't get there until 15 minutes after the blast? Or what if, you know, how, how does that approach look differently? And it doesn't mean you shouldn't still go through March or care or X, ABC or whatever you're using, but, you know, what do you, here's what I know if I show up 15 minutes after an explosion or a shooting. If they had a bleed that was going to kill them in the first three minutes, they've been dead for nine minutes. I mean, I'm not a mathematician, but I know that. But it doesn't mean I'm still not looking for life-threatening bleeds first. So right. the problem is in a small window of time with people who are new at this, we don't have time to look at all those variables. They'll start asking questions an hour into class. Well, what if there's six people hurt? What if there's 26 people? And really our intention in a short window of time is let's get you through how to take care of one person. Because the reality is in the 30-some-odd years I've been doing this, more often than not, we got way more help than we need. It's very rare that it's you versus the whole Nakatomi block. <laughs> right. You know? Right. So so I think we just have to kind of go back and really look at how we train. And, and you know, it takes time, which we said is the biggest, you know, the shortest resource we all have is time. And the other thing we're trying to get away from is the notionalization part. How many of these things do we just verbalize and not actually do? And that's the part where medics start to realize, you know, when they come to an active shooter scenario or they come to a training scenario, and we make them actually do the skill set, it all goes to heck. You know what I mean? They're like, oh, I, you know, because you've been notionalizing this part forever. You know, that, my, one of my favorite parts of any of the courses is, one of my passions, is the lifts, the drags, and the carries. Just because I know for 20-some odd years, that's the last class we teach, we glaze over it, and we make the general assumption that, no, oh, we got a team of people here. we got a whole SWAT team. It'll be easy. We'll just throw them in the truck and drive away. And then – you know, the first time you let them try to do it on somebody who's truly unresponsive or good at pretending to be unresponsive, you know, it all goes to heck. They right. can't. And they just never, you know, they've never thought about that actual dead weight. Nobody's helping me. Or oh, hey, we'll pretend yeah. to carry him down. I, that was a question that came up uh, the other day for me. I said, uh, I see you guys have mega movers. Do you, are you going to carry people down the stairs? And they said, Well, let's just see what they do. I said, Okay. I said, Just looking at it from a safety standpoint, you know, we can call safety timeout because, in my experience, they're going to bounce people's heads off the treads. And, um, yeah, I'm not gonna let you do that to a role player. They'll yeah, never come back. Yeah, we, we can't we can't do that. And then now we had some some smaller people and some bigger firefighters who were doing a great job at it. And then they had one big dude. I was like, you walk down the steps and we'll put you back on it. Trust me. Yeah. Again, or substitute the mannequin in. Right. Put the mannequin yeah. in there. <clears throat> yeah. Rescue Randy doesn't complain. Uh, yeah. You know things like that. But yeah, we've really a lot of uh, at least locally we've gotten away from uh, even in even in paramedic school we don't we don't verbalize. You want to start the IV, start the IV. You know, we you, usually now you might have a pre-connected IV bag because after the first, you know, 30 iterations, I'm sure you can run that line through. But you're going to start the IV on the prosthetic arm. You're going to you're going to run the line. You're going to do the whole do it do whatever because I want that time suck. I want you to see that things aren't magic. Uh, even in teach in when we do TECC for our graduates, put a pressure dressing on. Oh, I put the tourniquet on. It's bleeding. Stop and like cover cover the wound. Okay, there's a stump there. That's an amputation. Cover that. Okay, I'll do it later. Do it now. <laughs> okay. Yeah, find the equipment. Do. Yeah, right. find the equipment that it takes to do it and actually go through the motions of doing it. Right. So yeah, we we've done some large scale, which has been fun the last couple of years with my full time job with Tomahawk Strategic. We've done some active shooter scenarios for some pretty big hospitals, and and they're not used to doing that. You know, so I'll get in a room. And I'll say, okay, here's what you got. Show me. And they're like, okay, he's now innovated. We put in a chest tube. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, stop. I'm like, seems to me how, like how did he's still you how did, laying there? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, you, I, okay, if you want, if you want to say he's innovated, you got to show me every single tool that would be required for you to do the innovation or RSI or whatever it is. If you're going to say he's got a, a chest tube, 
go find that stuff. And what you find is that they've got, you know, staff that don't work in the ER that are down there backfilling, which makes sense, but that, that staff doesn't know where to locate the gear, you know, and then the light bulbs start going off or like nobody's, you know, all of these treatment modalities aren't happening in 10 seconds. You know, maybe they are in your trauma bay with people who do this every day, but, you know, show, show us, this is, this is going to take time and resources. You know, how many, you know, we've had 26 notional patients. You put them all on a ventilator. Show me that you even have 26 vents. Yeah. Right. That you this, can go get you know, the next five minutes. Right. Yeah, and they don't. Yeah. And then, you know, then suddenly the, the light bulb goes off. So I think it, it, it's training. You know what I mean? It's for us going back to how we train coming through and going back to, to managing expectations. And it's the same with that rescue task force. The, you know, we've trained, I trained, I don't know, hundreds of agencies and we still are training some fire and EMS agencies that are very resistant to any RTF stuff. And frankly, they don't want any part of it. You know, they, they, they want to do it the way it's always been done. And I understand that, um, you know, our counter argument is it's about, whose expectations are we managing? And, and the public's expectation is if you think, if you think the public's going to be okay with you being four blocks away on a radio waiting for it to be completely safe while third graders are bleeding to death, like that's never going to play well in the, you know, the court of public opinion anymore. Um, but that also doesn't, yeah, but it also doesn't mean you should be running into a building and not have the training and not have the equipment that, that you deserve, um, you know, and, and just buying five vests and throwing them on your rig and, putting you through an intro to TECC class once and calling it good is probably not fair to you either. So, you know, we as a system need to find a, a better balance to give them the tools that they need. You know, they need to have ample time to practice this stuff, ample training, you know, and then somehow figure out how you're going to get that in amongst all of the other training and requirements that they already still have. Right. Absolutely. <clears throat> so first, so obviously the first responders, you know, we've got our own set of problems and, you know, dogma and, unwillingness to have that paradigm shift so where how does where did how or yeah how does first care provider bridge that gap because i think we both agree that the bystander the civilian the soccer mom is going to be there before us one way or the other um yeah for what we wanted to do with first care providers we wanted to create and, and again it wasn't i'm not going to say that it was our original idea um, because what we saw is people were already doing it, right? If, if you were already teaching TECC to firefighters and medics and EMTs, then it was a natural occurrence for you to go, you know what, I'm going to teach my church security group. I'm going to teach the guys I work with I'm gonna, or the gals. Or, you know, so people were doing it. What we realized is some people were doing it great. Some people were doing it poorly. There was no, there was no consistency, and, and especially on the military side. We had military guys standing up, and, you know, now you're teaching – you're teaching hockey coaches how to how to do decompression needles, and that's so far outside the scope of their practice that it. So we really wanted to just make it as simple as possible, and yet cover you know the common causes of preventable traumatic death, and that's really what we wanted. We're like, hey, how do we come up with a very clean, systematic approach that makes sense? Because what we were seeing, even on the EM, EMS or even on the first responder side, is I, I don't think you can spend six hours or four hours with a patrol officer and think he's going to walk away with a thorough understanding of March and how to apply it. I think it's unfair to him. I think you need to pare it back and simplify it and really look at, in the smallest window of time we've got, what's a realistic expectation of what, what they can come out of here with being able to do. And then from that point forward, we can add on. So first care provider's intent was let's come up with a certification process, and ours is a minimum of four hours of training. We'd love it to be a full day, you know, so they can run more scenarios. And in that four hours, what are the high points that we can hit? Um, you know, it's turning. And it's all, you know, essentially we don't use March. We use care. But at the end of the day, it's the same stuff. You know what I mean? We just think it's a little simpler for civilians because civilians don't march around everywhere they go. Um, and, and it makes sort of sense that you're providing care to somebody. Um, you know, so they're going to control the bleeding. They're going to manage the airway. Right? They're going to check respirations, and then they're going to prevent exposure. You know, again, all the same four basic steps. And the other, the other thing I think for us that made us a little bit different, I think we wanted to take an approach. What we noticed on the on the TECC side, and and a little bit on the stop to bleed side, is that it's all very right of bang, right? It's all something bad has happened. Here's how you fix it, which is great. Um, but we were like, hey, if we're going to spend a little bit of time with folks, why would we not talk about the left of bank stuff? Why would we not talk about, hey, what what are the things you could do? 
to maybe avoid anybody even bleeding before we get started because that, that that's pretty valuable stuff you know the situational awareness stuff the and and that stuff applies even if it's right of bang if you're going to teach medics or civilians or anybody to start rendering aid how, how do you do that and still not become a victim yourself you know we always say we want you to be a part of the solution and never become a part of the problem we don't want to get there as trained responders and have five people bleeding because you tried to help and you got injured too and that it's easy to throw those things out, right? In EMS, we just go with the standard, you know, scene safe PSI. You know, and I, and I just think we needed to focus a little more on that. First Care tried to do that. Like, let's stop saying, is the scene safe? And let's say, is it safe enough? Because you don't live in a safe world. You're working on the side of the road. People are driving by at 80 miles an hour, updating their Facebook. It's never safe. <laughs> so, so that was a little bit of, of, of sort of what made us want to do something different. And so as far as, as that, have you seen a big draw to it? Uh, I mean, so there, there's a couple things. And I guess the reason I'm asking that is because re- recently, like I've gotten a little a little dejected when it comes to teaching some of these groups. And, and, and it might be because a lot of them have been voluntold um, to show up. And I get that with a lot of schools. Our state just did a – or they, they're still doing – um, it's a statewide campaign to put these um, bleeding kits in classrooms and in schools, which is great. It's absolutely great. Um, you know, we had a we had a school shooting here a couple of years ago, um, the Townville shooting, and they call them. They even call them the Jacob kits uh, after after the child who died. And it was it was great. The state supported it. Um, the I, I can't remember the organization that got all the money for it, but they want to put these in every school. And they're the small individual type you know, stop the bleed type kits. And the next thing to do was to train everybody. So every once in a while, like we have a, we have a a charter high school on our college campus and we went over to do some training as part of a student project. And it was just like, eh, you know, they don't, we didn't, they're like, you have 35 minutes. I'm like, we need, we need an hour and a half at the, at the very least. They're like, no, you have 35 minutes. I'm like, I'll teach you how to put a tourniquet on, but you're going to have to come over for other stuff. Uh, Okay. And other other times where I've been places, every time you know you start to pull out the bleeding kit, you know, and or the the um, the the gunshot wound in a box, and you hook that up and it starts bleeding everywhere, and I get people going, I'm not touching that. I'm like, it's not real blood. I don't I don't want to do that. That's making me sick to my stomach. I'm like, oh, this could be your fourth grader next week. You're gonna have to. This is something you might be faced with. It might be you and your family in a car wreck tomorrow. Uh, up in the mountains and the the next volunteer rescue squad is 30 minutes away and the helicopter can't fly. So put it in, maybe put it in context for them. And, you know, then it turns into, even if I can get past that, I have people coming to courses who have their counterfeit tourniquets that they bought a three pack on Amazon for $8. And it's like, you got to throw that out. Here's what you need to do. Um, you know, so the ones that I do get to come to course, the courses, they seem like they, you know, there's a lot more other education that goes into besides just, you know, how to stop the bleed, how to pack a wound, why chest seal is important, so on and so forth, keeping people warm. And, you know, it's all this other stuff that has been kind of like propagated out there on top of the people being voluntold or the church groups that come in thinking that they're going to be shooting people. Like this is a response to an active shooter in the in the sanctuary. I'm like, that's this is medical. Like you, you're learning the something bad has happened. You've been involved. You didn't create the situation, but you have to deal with it. So I'm going to teach you. We're going to, you know, s- stay alive until someone like me comes through the door with other equipment and can get you to the trauma surgeon. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot there to unpack that you kind of handle, Chris. And it's true. It's it's one of the more common questions we'll get because, like I said, we're really now we focus a lot on training instructors. And I and guys will ask, well, you know, what do I do if I only get 30 minutes? What do I do if I get 50 minutes to teach? What, what should I hit on? And my my stance on any of that is no matter what, because they'll ask me how much time do you want? And and as a trainer at heart, I want two weeks. You know <laughs> what I mean? If you give me two days, I want five. If you give me five, I want 16 because we'll just keep doing more. But I think I think the challenge for us as instructors is – no matter how little amount of time they they get with you, maximize that time and leave them wanting more, and and take that time and shed light on, you know, people. You know, you generally fall in a couple of different types of groups. You get the the one guy, who's, the folks who show up and think they know everything. And then I was a boy scout. I took a first aid class 90 years ago, and I'm a ninja at this. And and that's okay. That's easy to work with because all you got to do is start giving them a little bit of scenario based stuff, or give them a 
you know, a true clot, like you said, or a gunshot wound in a box, let it bleed all over them, let them struggle, and, and you'll get their attention. Um, or you get that this isn't for me. And, and those folks are tougher not to crack because at the end of the day, it's intimidating stuff. And, and you've got to find a way. And I think that's what we've done well with First Care is we found a way to have people leave these things feeling empowered. And, and that's the reason, like we, we touched a little on our podcast, is we want to share stories of, of civilians that have done this. We want them to know right from the get-go, you do not need to be a combat medic to do this. You don't need to be a 20-year firefighter or law enforcement officer to do this. Um, and, and by almost by intention, every slide in our slideshow is a picture of a six-year-old little boy or girl doing the skills. You know, and that's by design. Because if you're sitting there saying, I can't do this, and now you're watching a six-year-old put a chest seal on, well, you know, that kind of invalidates your argument. <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot, you know, that you kind of hit on that. It, it, it's spot on. They kind of got voluntold to be there. And the other thing that's a challenge with that is I, I think when we start looking at it is the reality is our first responders are, are the best in the world, yet they're understaffed, they're underpaid, and they're far undertrained. So the challenge for us is how do we educate the public in a way that makes them want to learn more and be involved and sheds light on the fact that, that first responders are doing the best they can but doesn't do it in a negative way. And And we're doing that already when we do active shooter training, which civilians are absolutely flocking to. And and so we've drawn a lot of parallels to that. And an active shooter, the message for civilians is either, you know, avoid, deny, defend, or run, hide, fight. Do a couple of smart things in the first few minutes to buy time till an expert gets to you. Well, that's the exact same message on the medicine side. You know what I mean? Do something, do a couple of decisions in the beginning here to save a life, your own life or somebody else's, until an expert gets to you. So, so you know, we've got to sort of make sure that we align our forces together because I think people are, are understanding that. But it's it's difficult to show up. You know, I showed up, I volunteered tens of thousands of dollars of training to my kids' schools. You know, and obviously I've got a vested interest. I'm dropping my kids off for eight hours a day. And their answer was, you know, the standard answer we hear, well, well you know, we appreciate that, but we have a school nurse. You know, come to find out she's there Tuesdays and Thursdays. I'm like, okay, I'll make sure my kids only fall on those days, you know. Um, and they're like, well, we have a fire station that's literally a block away. And I was like, well, it's great that they're a block away and they never go anywhere else. They just sit at the station all year waiting for my kid to get hurt. And she's like, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, when there's a fire and they leave, you know, where's the next fire station? She's like, well, that's 26 minutes away. And I'm like, okay, well, you, then you need to look. You know, I, I think the civilian perspective is always that when my emergency happens to me, number one, hopefully it'll never happen to me, right? That I'll play the numbers game, and the odds are this is a freak accident. It's always going to happen to somebody else. Um, but if it does happen to me, the stars will be aligned, and I'm going to get the most highest trained SEAL Team 6 ninja to come through the door, and I'm going to get the greatest medic on the planet Earth to come through the door, and they're going to get here in two minutes because they just happen to be walking by. Um, you know, and you know, on your best day, maybe that's the case. We, we, we did a class out in California. Um, we had a lot of CERT members. And, you know, the CERT organization is interesting because, you know, these are folks who are out there doing training. These are folks who have time and want to, to do more. And the CERT members were very proactive in the class. And what we found is the firefighters in the class weren't so proactive. And, and when we started probing, and they were like, hey, our city response is about five minutes, four and a half to five minutes, which is great. And I'm like, hey, that's awesome, and you should celebrate that. And I'm like, but my question for you is if I'm at home and my wife's having a heart attack and there's also a bomb City Hall on that day, are you still going to get to my house in five minutes? Or if there's an active shooting at the elementary school that day, God forbid, you know, do you think you'll still make that five minute window time? <laughs> you know, what I mean? what if you were having chest pain out of San Bernardino when that whole thing unfolded? <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Like, so we have to look at it from a different lens. And I think that's a way to present. And I think you, you touched on it too, is, you know, don't think of this as the, you know, I'm on the subway and I randomly come up upon this person and I see blood everywhere and I decide, hey, I don't want to get involved here. That's your own personal decision. But look at it as if, you know, you walk in the garage and now your kid went through a play glass window. Are you not going to get involved then? Are you going to look for gloves then? No. Like, you know what I mean? Like cha change the scope of how you look at this. And, and I think that gets people to sort of to more buy into the table, gets people to sit up and go, you know what? Maybe this does apply to me. You know what I mean? Maybe I'm not looking at it from just one lens of, oh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not randomly going to help stop and help, you know, one random person on the street. And then there are other people who absolutely would stop and help. We, we want people to stop and help, obviously. But we want to find a way to put them at comfort and give them the skills. And, and I think that's the, 
the biggest thing that we've come across. We we polled thousands of students, and and the question asked was, what are the reasons you wouldn't stop and help someone? You know, and and I'd propose that to to you or to the listeners. What do you think the most common answers we're going to get are? Because I think when we show up to each class, we need to be prepared to address those things. Um, and, and, you know, and they're the standard answers, right? I'm afraid of a lawsuit. I'm afraid of liability. So we've got to make sure we're educating them on the Good Samaritan laws and how they apply. Uh, I'm afraid of catching some kind of disease, right? And we've got to educate them on, you know, on, on personal protective equipment and on how likely, how low the likelihood is of, of actually catching something from bloodborne pathogens. You know, and then the last one is I'm afraid that I would make it worse or I wouldn't know what to do. And I know we can completely fix that. That's the whole intent of these programs is, yes, you, you can know what to do. We can give you a simple algorithm to follow. 